Hello, everyone. Greetings. Uh, bienvenue à tous et à toutes pour cette neuvième édition de Laser Hexagram Montréal. Welcome to the ninth edition of our Laser Hexagram Montreal. Thank you for joining us. So my name is Gisèle Trudel, and I'm an artist and professor at the École des Arts Visuels et Médiatiques de Lucam, and a Hexagram Research Member. And I've been working with Nina Tiglady uh, as organizers of the Lasers at Hexagram since 2014. And we thank Hexagram for its continued support. We would like also to acknowledge the Ganyankaaga Nation, Mohawk Nation, as custodians of the land and waters on which we present this round table tonight. And now I pass on to Nina, who gives a brief introduction to the lasers. Hello, hello everybody, and very welcome to our laser evening tonight. I would like to thank Giselle, and I would like to tell all, uh, thank all the presenters as well as all the participants of this evening. In 2008, Pierre Scarufi, a very independent-minded cultural historian started this laser series in San Francisco. And since then, it has expanded now into a network of 45 lasers around the world. But what is amazing about it, not only that it remains so independent, but also that this network extends from small places in Brazil to Tehran, New Zealand, everywhere. And here in Hexagram, we were really proud to be able to have lasers with Giselle. Thank you again, and everybody else, uh, for the last uh, literally five years, or going on six. Thank you again. Bye. OK, so tonight's laser is presented yes, in of Hexagram. Okay. Oops, I have a background noise. Um, presented in the context of Hexagram's first interdisciplinary summit, uh, web summit um, entitled Sympoietics, the Sharing of Agency and Autonomy. <clears throat> the title refers to the neologism created by Canadian Beth Dempster in 1998, which she invented as an alternative to urban planning analysis centered on the concept of autopoiesis. The symposium is conceived under this key concept uh, of the distribution and sharing and is elaborated further by Donna Haraway in 2016. The autonomous subject is a fiction. Autonomy, like agency elsewhere, only exists by, with, and in the sharing between multiple forces, materialities, processes, and entities, human and other than human. Sympoietic processes are expressed in collaborations, relations, and coextensions. So I'm very pleased to be able to present the presenters, tonight's presenters. So tonight and within this framework, we'll hear from Yehovah Lorenzo Jr., um, po, uh, doctor from uh, Universidade Federal do Espírito Santo in Brazil, postdoctoral fellow at Centre d'études de la Forêt in UCAM. Jorge Zavagno, Master's Candidate, Studio Arts Department, Concordia University. Leila Sujir, Professor, Artist and Professor, Studio Arts Department at Concordia University. And also David Howes, Professor, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Concordia University, Adjunct Professor, Faculty of Law, McGill University, and Hexagram Research Member. So I pass on the mic to you, uh, Yehovah. Okay, hopefully you can see, can hear me and can see my screen now. Yeah, so uh, before I get started, I, I wanna say a couple of words and first congratulations for the Hexagon folks for organizing this event in a so timely subject, right? We are going to discuss forest under different perspectives here. And thank you for the invitation as well. So we're gonna be presenting for you today, hydraulic architecture of trees adjusting to survive in a changing world. Okay. 
so I want to start this presentation with a, a question. Uh, just to bring some reflections about um, the importance of forest without uh, wanting to exhaust the subject, right? And I'm pretty sure you watching right now this presentation have different answers for this question. And I want to enc encourage you to uh, use the chat window now, the YouTube, to put some uh, point of view you have. Well, in light of science, uh, forest are the home of a huge biodiversity upon earth, uh, are the home of roughly 80% of the world that has for biodiversity. They're important for the food security as well, uh, important for the rainfall distribution. And something important I have to say here, sometimes we see some dichotomy, people saying, oh, uh, we need to remove forests to, to, because of the agriculture. And that's a very false claim I had to say, because we know today that they are so important, the forests for bringing humidity, right? And we cannot even think uh, agriculture without forest. So if you wanna protect agriculture, you need to protect forest. The large sink of carbon dioxide that just not just improve the air quality, but also helps you regulate climate by uh, mitigating the greenhouse effect is important for the economy in Canada and it's a good example of that, right? It's a $19 billion uh, industry in 2013. So forests uh, provide a wide range of economic, social and, and environmental benefits. Because of that, the central interest in ecologists understand and predict how trees and forests respond to climate change. And a big question we have here is why tree species are differently affected by drought, okay? We see different papers trying to uh, answer this question and some trying to relate that to the plant body size and the tall plants would be more prone to die in the drought, but other, other papers showing the small ones are more prone. So there is no agreement around that. And what we propose in my, my research is zooming in and drawing close and see what's going on within those plants, right? So drawing close, the environmental change affect plants via cell level traits. I'm gonna repeat that. The environmental change affect plants via cell level traits. And I'm specifically talking about here the vessels, right? Vessels are very important because they uh, conduct water from root up to the leaves. And we have a contribution to this field of research by showing that if you understand, if you, by investigating the cell level traits, we can understand what is going on in the community level, right? And uh, that's very explain how species are selected in the plant communities. And that's very linked to the, uh, to the uh, environmental change as well. And some showing some species better adapted to the, the, the envir environment and so on. So by investigating those celibate traits, we propose that we cannot just understand, but predict what's going to happen in forest uh, worldwide uh, and in the sand impact of the climate change. So some hypothesis to help us understand the species differences in terms of uh, drought resistance. We know that wider vessels are, they conduct more water, but they all also take more risk of cavitation, right, of air bubbles in the system. And if the drought becomes too intense, that's what happens. Embolism, right? Stopping the water column. And that one is thought to be one of the main reasons why plant dies. So uh, this hypothesis, which is called hydraulic safety efficiency trade-off, is thought to be an important mechanism for plant ecology and evolution. We expect to find species uh, like the occurring along this gradient, uh, species with larger vessels, more efficient, but less drought resistant and so on. But looks like there's some con controversy about that. And this paper in 2016 found out a weak trade-off, right? But there's new pathways here. And uh, there's agreement around that. This wood traits are so complex, right? The hydraulic architecture of trees, they're so complex. complex. If you want to understand, we need uh, investigate more and more traits. 
And a good example of that are the interconduit pits with all those hydraulic microvalves, right? And here I'm comparing angiosperms or plant with flowers and conifers, right? So those uh, traits, they uh, thought to work just like valves. And let's say the plant is facing a dry day or a dry event and the vessel become embolized, here the conduit become embolized. This is what happens. This plug here, which is called torus, right? The figure you can see here, just block the passage of the air bubble, allowing the plant to bypass embolized vessels and keep the water flow up to the leaves. That's, that's fantastic, right? I, I never tired to be amazed by those plants. We never know what, what had, that is within those plants until we analyze. And that's a very important trait uh, if you want to understand a hydraulic of trees, okay? And it turns out those uh, uh, hydraulic valves can be a little bit different in the species. And if the torus is not large enough, that what can happen, like, the valve fails, provoking all the hydraulic system, the plant to fail and then the plant dies. So with that in mind, we started to think how to approach, how to develop a technique to assess a deeper understanding of the hydraulic architecture of the species. And here uh, we specifically talking about the conifer species. We analyzed jack pine, white spruce, balsam fir and white spruce. They were tested in this rain exclusion experiment. Okay. Since uh, 2014, and we developed uh, some uh, methodology to assess that. And something very important is how quick we can assess this hydraulic architecture of those trees. And that's the result. We scanned hundreds of images like that, and we got a very nice. Uh, methodology as we can do this kind of images very quickly and and that was very important. I have to say thank you for a person here, Danny Filippo, for the help. And we developed this. Thank you. And the, ni the nice thing about this image is we can flip and, and see different angles and make fast, right? Make analysis and so on. So I'm going to present some results here quickly. So jack pine uh, is the outstanding species uh, compared to all the other species because it has this larger uh, trachea associated, the scandis, right? Associated with those pit trays which are larger. So there's a high capacity of transporting water associated with the fast growth. So the species will fall, uh, thicker stem diameter and even more spaces provided for having even larger vessels, right? Suggesting that the species is a stronger competitor for water and light. And when we analyze those micro valves that I was just talking about right now, that's what we found out. Jack Pine has this well-coordinated adjustment in the pit traits along the time, keeping a large torus overlap, and at the same time, more space available to the water flow so less resistant to flow. That's very interesting. Uh, just step back and remember that I was talking about those plants should trade off. There's some hypothesis, right? Should trade off between safety and efficiency, but it looks like jack pine have the best of the both worlds, right? If you compare that with the balsam fir, for example, you see over time there's this tiny uh, overlap and here so the species would, would be much more prone to fail this, uh, this valve, hydraulic valve, right? Okay, so a quick conclusion, Jack Pine has evolved a mechanism that adjusts its hydraulic architecture to optimize both hydraulic safety and efficiency, resulting in high growth performance. Now I wanna place this findings in larger scale and because we, we know uh, there's some prediction the boreal forest is gonna become warmer and dry in the future. And if that happens, it's a very concerning because as we saw, the species has differences in terms of hydraulic architecture. And we, we should expect a species replacement with more species like jack pine occurring in a larger number, right? Because they are more, better adapted to this future. 
And now I, I want to place this finding, I want to zoom out even more and place this find globally. And that's a very recent paper published and we'd say tropical forests are losing ability to observe carbon dioxide. That's the study published in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, where we see uh, tropical forests losing uh, their contribution to the uh, history of carbon sink, whereas border forests increasing, right? So there's an equilibrium here which has been uh, broken, and that's very concerning. As we know, uh, the deforestation is a strongly associated with fire in the forest, right? So forests not just lose the ability to absorb carbon dioxide, but become source of carbon dioxide. And that's the result, intensification of greenhouse effect. You see more carbon here, the, the planet Earth heating more and more. That's really concerning because there is a feedback effect here. I, I, I have to say, so uh, it's speeding up this process even more. Okay. And that's the fact, right? The intensification of those, uh, increasing the intensity of and frequency of those extreme events like hurricanes, fire and forest and flooding, <clears throat> ice melting, with some cities predicted to flood and sea level rise, for example, here, for example. Okay. And looks like there's a very, very clear signal out there, right? I have to say very clear. So we need to do something, right? And this is boiling frog tail, uh, which is a metaphor has been frequently used to depict the human inaction to respond to those, um, those facts we are watching in the news, right? This intensification of the global warming. And I think if there is a message here the most important have the liver is about uh, the, the climate change. As we see out there, the number of those deniers increasing even more. And you know, facts is not a matter of uh, just ideas, but the facts are facts, it's not opinion, right? So we need to address those facts. Personally, I don't think we're gonna be boiled down, right? Just like frogs, because we have science to let us know in advance and, and do something, react to those threats. So I want to summarize what I spoke today for you and say the celebrate traits are determinant of species ability to survive environmental change. A trait selection is thought to scale up globally favoring species with more safe and efficient hydraulic architecture just like Jack Fine. The loss of forests speed up climate change. We need address the facts, urgently address the facts. There is no time anymore to discuss uh, this, this fact and deny the, the truth, right? So before uh, finishing, I, I have to say thanks for the folks who have been supported uh, my research. And thank you so much, Danny Nishaw, Danny Rule here in, in Canada, my advisors and authors, co-authors in papers. Without them, I wouldn't be here presenting this study to you. And of course, uh, thank you all for watching this presentation. And I'm, I'm gonna be glad for answering any questions. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Yehovah. Thank you very much. Um, we're realizing that there's a little uh, bug with the chat in YouTube. Um, I'm just wondering what what is the procedure that you suggest, um, Sylvain? I'm just wanted to see what you what you think to do. We go to the next guest. Okay, so. Uh, thank you, Yehovah. What we generally do is um, have a question from the audience, 
and uh, and we we could have uh, uh, we'll go on with Jorge and then we'll uh, and Leila and then we'll see how we can backtrack and, and have some questions for you as well, Yehova. But I would have some as well. So uh, we pass on now to Jorge Zavagno and Leila Sujier. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. I'll share my screen. Okay, I'm just waiting to see if Leela is joining me. Yes, there yeah, we go. Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. I'm here. So um, you're looking at a wiggle gif, which is an earlier iteration from another century of stereoscopic video. So um, we'll let you be entertained by this as we begin our uh, presentation. We'd like to start by thanking the organizers, Giselle Trudell and Nina Siglady, for inviting us to this laser presentation today, Forest Drawing Close. So our background with 3D. I began working with 3D video in 2006 at the Bounce Center in a cave environment, which is an early full-bodied stereoscopic virtual reality. In 2012-2013, I was lead on a research project with Paul Kreuter and Roman Kreuter, one of the IMAX inventors, an inventor of a 3D drawing tool, Sandy, adapting it as a, a performance tool funded by Sank Mitaps. In fall 2015, Elastic Spaces, a research creation project I'm leading, developed several research exchanges, one in October 2015, another one in February 2016, supported by a Shirt Connections grant. Chris Kreuter, Roman Kreuter's grandson, joined us working with a custom build of the Christie Digital Projectors from Hexagram UCAM. In spring 2016, Elastic Spaces received a Shirt Partnership Development Grant working with the industry partner Janro, Paul Kreuter, and the curator Hema Sivanasan at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. In that spirit of possibility, we began the Elastic Spaces project marked by a matrix of technologies and communities, both within place and time. The excitement of what was possible with these custom builds led us, along with the deep curiosity in the world around us. The 360 camera was coming out and we were waiting for the hexagram unit to arrive. Uh, and I'll give a quick introduction to myself first. I, um, I am the technical director at Elastic Spaces. Um, my history with 3D began meeting Chris Kreuter uh, at college and then getting the opportunity to work with him at the NFB Stereo Lab and then the um, IMAX documentary filmmaker, uh, Stephen Lowe, we, uh, who is the son of prominent uh, IMAX director Colin Lowe, uh, who directed the uh, Fogo Island series, which was part of Challenge for Change. Um, as an assistant uh, in post-production, assistant editor, I worked on four documentaries for Stephen Lowe, three of which were in 3D. And uh, then I went on to do uh, post-production supervising for independent documentaries. Uh, and somewhere around then in 2016, I, went back to the project of Elastic Spaces and back to uh, 3D. I'm now currently doing a master's here at Concordia, researching ethical dilemmas in documentary filmmaking using stereoscopic and uh, 360 video technologies. So then the equipment arrived and Chris Kreider asked me if our research space could house a lot of used IMAX equipment that had just come back from China. I checked, it was spring, there was space. So I moved the crates in and you're seeing all the crates that moved in. By a lot, we mean really a lot. And we worked with two Elastic Spaces research assistants, cleaning, creating an inventory and assembling what we had. The 360 camera still had not arrived at Hexagram UCAM for the shoot I had planned in the forest close to the art gallery of Greater Victoria responding to an invitation from curator Hema Sivanesan to make an art project for exhibition at the gallery. 
My mother had died in 2015 June on my birthday and I wanted to be in a forest space she had taken me as a young woman on the anniversary of her death coming up in June that year, 2016. At an earlier time, when I was 24, she had taken me to the West Coast Forest after I had been treated for cancer and had been cleared of any difficulty. The challenge then was to live fully. Chris suggested the rig he was assembling with two of Concordia's F65 cameras could shoot IMAX quality footage. So the Forrester's research space was beginning. So what you see here is the uh, equipment which had arrived and it arrived via rail on a pallet and the art gallery text told me I was the first artist who had shipped using rail. They were shocked and they were also shocked by the volume of crates. We picked up the gear in a Ford 150 and started the research towards the forest chute. Andy McKinnon, a forest environmental scientist, asked if we would go to the Walbrun, which was facing clear cutting. One of the founders of the one of the founders of the Ancient Forest Alliance, T.J. Watt, showed us where the Walbrun was. You'll see his finger on a map on, at the right. There is no GPS coverage or Wi-Fi on the logging roads, so we really, really were. Uh, in our research challenged by trying to find these locations. Mm -hmm. uh, but they found locations. I wasn't involved in this uh, shoot, but as Leela mentioned, the, uh, you can see the rig here uh, with all the equipment. It's two F65 cameras. They are, uh, as you can see, one acts as the left eye, one acts as the right eye. They are mounted on a tango uh, mirror rig, which means that there's a mirror that is bouncing 50% of the light upwards and 50% goes through. And that's how we achieve the parallax needed. Um, the uh, other part of this is that the F65 cameras are able to shoot 4K natively and can even be up rest afterwards to 8K. Uh, and that created a lot of data to manage. And this was all done this shoot, I believe it was four people uh, that went out with all this gear uh, with Lila. Uh, then this is when I joined the project uh, in August, we uh, received all the footage and there was 45 individual shots. And when it comes to 3D stereoscopic video, you have your left and your right eye and you have to align them to make sure that the uh, viewer can get the, uh, the parallax that creates the depth of field, that immersion. Uh, each clip, you uh, align it, you sync the video so that they both play back at the exact same time and uh, you color match it in case sometimes the angles can change the way the sun hits the subject. Um, and then here we have an example that I'll let Leela explain. Yes, um, this is uh, as one of the sites uh, where you see, uh, it, it's called Red Creek Fir. And Jorge, if you just put your uh, cursor uh, and we'll show you how tall Chris is. Okay, so he's, that's his height and he's over six feet. So the trees are immense. Uh, we're, uh, we, we were able to go to a number, four different sites of old growth forest. Uh, here's another one. And this one was called Avatar Grove. And here we are um, talking again about the matrix of people in places and spaces. So Sarah Turner, a prof in geography and planning at Concordia, Concordia invited me over as she had been a young pro protester as a high school student in the 90s in the Carmana Walburn protests. And it was the part of the Walburn we have just been showing you in the footage. And this was, has not been preserved. The other, as a result of the 90s protests became the Carmana Walburn Park. Sarah came to see the footage in the black box and told us it was the closest experience to an old growth forest without being in a forest. 
I told her I had to meet an ethnobotanist, Nancy Turner, the next day in Victoria. And she replied happily, I can phone her, she's my mom. Nancy, a distinguished ethnobotanist, and her book is at the right side of the screen, had an extensive conference she invited me to, Indigenous Peoples, Land Rights, and the Role of Ethnoecology and Ethnobotany, Strategies for Canada's Future, where many conversations take place. And this project, The Forest, that we're showing you today is just one of its outcomes. The book arising from the conference has just been published by McGill Queen's Press, and it's called Plants, People and Places, and there's going to be a book launch for it on November 18th. Later that spring, I met the person on the left of the screen, a renowned forestry science scientist, Suzanne Simard, whose work on the underground commu communication of trees and her mother tree project deeply connected to the forest project in progress that we, we are developing. So here you see um, a slice of the footage we shot in 2016. It's called Forest Breath. And it came about as a way to work with the footage as a, as a first step. And um, it's about a third of a frame and it's got a custom build projection system that you see at the right, using two projectors, optical polarizers, and circular polarized glasses for the viewer, along with a silver screen for projection. It allowed us to start the research for the return to the Walburn Forest that we would begin uh, with a project called Ariel that we'll also show you clips of. The blur, which is, um, in a clip that you'll see next, was a way of cutting across two scenes in 3D so that the shift would not be harsh for the viewer's eyes. It also communicated the sense of a shift from one space to another with a perceptible audio coming through the subwoofers, a felt embodied shift. During a bio blitz at the Walburn, we met Elder Bill Jones from the Pachida First Nation who invited us to a community lunch where we were able to build a relationship with the community over time. Uh, and we're now working on a new shirt project with them. We received permission for our shoot and continued having conversations and exchanges in the nearby Walburn Old Growth Forest and at a community screening that we held in Port Renfrew. So here, I'll start the short clip. Be some problem. We'll skip it for now. See, we'll see if we can get it to work afterwards. So we'll go over to the aerial, which Leela mentioned that this is, we were able to get permission and uh, there on the left, you can see the Leela talking to uh, Elder Bill Jones during the filming. We used a drone uh, with a red uh, weapon camera attached to a stabilizer to be able to allow for the smooth traveling of um, uh, video uh, that will feel like a bird, uh, like a, a hummingbird. Uh, yeah. And one of the um, processes that uh, we, we took on as an essential part of production that's not normally part of produ production is a community screening to keep the media gathering from being extractive because this is a community that its old growth forests are, are being extracted. And as well, the, the community itself, the Pachidat First Nation are forestry people. So as we've gotten to know them, they've been explaining a 500 year cedar plan that they're just beginning to implement. So we are very thankful that we had this opportunity as part of an extension of the exhibition, a community outreach 
uh, for the supernatural exhibition. Okay, so here's a clip, hopefully this will work, from Ariel. So Leela, if you can explain this uh, for a second, sure. I'll try and find another sure. way to show this. Sure. Um, one of the things I mentioned to you is that we went back and forth to the community, first of all, showing them the footage of Ariel after we we shot it. So the August 2018, uh, we completed the shoot. Then we had a, we shipped the hexagram UCAM comp uh, projector out to Port Renfrew and uh, set it up in an elementary school gymnasium. And then the following January, January we took the edit. So this is um, the edit being shown and we put it into a VR headset to give the viewers a sense of what it would look like in an IMAX screen when the screen itself is uh, very, very large. So we were showing it both on a video that you can see on a monitor at, on the image in the left, as well as in an Oculus headset. Okay, uh, so I'm going to stop this sharing and I'll switch to a different to be able to see the uh, excerpt. So one second, I'll stop. And we'll go back to the presentation. Perfect. And I just thought I'd talk a little bit about this as the end text. After showing the edit, uh, which you just saw um, some documentation of the screening, we asked the, um, the council for the Petita First Nation what they would like to do if they'd like to add a text at the end. And they were, this is their unceded territory. So they decided to uh, write it. And Bill Jones was the elder working with us. 
and it's his words and it's the band council um, who as in a group process work together. So this is the final text of the, of the work. And here, here's the screening uh, that the project received. Um, Ariel is one of five artists experiments with IMAX technologies commissioned by Janine Marcheseau with the support of a Canada Council grant. Chris Croyder went from working with us in Elastic Spaces to managing the project. The Walter Klassen remote head he had, an arm that held the camera, allowed Michael Snow's cityscape project shot on Toronto Island to invert the city. The other artists, Lisa Jackson with Lycan, Kelly Richardson with Ember and the, and the Giants, and Oliver Hussain with Garden of the Legend of the Golden Snail, all used aspects of the custom builds Chris Coyter had made. With Ariel, I used a heavy lift drone, moving as if it were a hummingbird. So this was the first screening of the project and then the subsequent screenings have been affected by COVID because there's no theaters available. So we're excited to have, uh, to look forward to new screenings. Forest Breath, um, has continued to be shown. Um, this is a screening and exhibition September through December 2019 at the Surrey Art Gallery. And we're looking forward to uh, post-COVID uh, working with the development of the 2016 forest into an immersive installation. And uh, Jorge and I would like to thank you this is our uh, website for Elastic Spaces, giving you a sense of uh, the team and the uh, development of projects that we're working on. And um, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Well, uh, again, another wonderful presentation. Um, we, I just wanna say we're, we're experiencing some kind of lag with YouTube. Uh, so we won't be able to take questions from the publics right now. Um, we'll continue right away with David's presentation and then we might take a brief pause and then connect back on again so that we can have the discussion with our, within ourselves, but also with the people attending. So I'll, uh, it's now to you, David, thank you. There we go. Um, I apologize for not uh, being, uh, having started my video um, at the appropriate time. Um, my presentation, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Giselle and Nina ever so much for uh, having invited me to take part in this evening's discussion, uh, which uh, ranges over so many different perspectives on forests drawing close. And my intervention is from a different angle, uh, having to do with my interest in architecture and urbanism and the ways in which uh, indeed uh, wood uh, might save us. And my point to begin with uh, comes from uh, the uh, historian and sociologist Richard Sennett, who speaks of the way in which our contemporary urban environment um, is one that is characterized by an intense dullness and uh, monotony and a tactile sterility. And he blames this, as does Johanni Palasma, a very prominent uh, Finnish architect who has written a book called The Eyes of the Skin, on the hegemony of the visual um, and the way in which architects are designing with sort of form and volume and the sight lines in mind and not um, in effect properly engaging the whole sensorium. This is perhaps you know, most uh, extraordinarily exemplified by the inter-reflecting glass towers of the contemporary urban uh, conurbation. And that 
way in which you know, glass is used so extensively uh, and the way in which uh, the materials uh, impact on us, uh, the steel and the glass, has this dehumanizing effect, uh, according to, uh, to Senate, uh, and also to Palasma, that Palasma would argue that we need to design with all the senses in mind, and we have to start thinking about other materials uh, besides steel and glass. Now, you know, interestingly, in New York City, in the last two years, there was a ban um, which has been imposed on the construction of steel and glass skyscrapers in the sense that uh, now builders are obliged to use other materials besides those two uh, because of the way in which those uh, have such a negative uh, ecological footprint. And so there is the beginning of a turn toward embracing, well, concrete as usual, but other forms of material as well. And the most dramatic example of um, a kind of material uh, that is making its presence felt uh, in the city uh, now in recent years is that of wood. And I wonder, Sylvain, if I could have the first slide in my presentation, if you have it, or um, I can put it up otherwise if, if need be. Um, so uh, I'm just uh, going to see if that slide comes or, and there we go. Um, this is uh, a design for a building. It doesn't actually exist yet. Um, and it is a design for a building in downtown Toronto, uh, Penda um, it's, uh, is the architect. Uh, and it consists of an 18 story wood construction. Now you can see and perhaps detect you know, elements of Habitat 67, uh, Safdie's great creation in Montreal and that this too consists of these you know, prefabricated cells that have been combined in this kind of way. And this idea of living in this kind of treehouse um, is one that um, I you know, suggest might just uh, begin to sylvanize us. Um, the sylvan ideal, the, the wooded ideal uh, being incorporated into the city in this way um, stands in marked contrast uh, to the way in which we have relied so much on steel and glass, um, which have such unyielding surfaces uh, compared to wood. Wood, uh, you know, from its grain, um, from its smell uh, and also from its texture has this power, uh, arguably the sensory power um, that uh, has this potential to transform uh, our you know, relationship to our, 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 our surroundings. And this is actually comparatively recently um, that uh, you find this turn to wood. Long for a long time, wood uh, was dismissed as, uh, you know, at best a source of vernacular architecture. It's not the kind of material uh, with which uh, architects, self-respecting architects, would uh, would dabble. Um, but you find uh, a, a, a sort of a, a growth um, recently, um, you know, and, and an example of this is British Columbia. Um, which um, a few years back um, you know, uh, passed uh, a, a law um, actually commanding um, the use of, of wood for structural purposes in, in building. And so you've got um, brick and beam buildings um, beginning to make a very prominent impact uh, in, uh, in sort of British Columbia, but also elsewhere across Canada. And these buildings are significant because, as I said, you know, for a long time, wood was not seen as a material um, that was of interest uh, to, to builders. Uh, and yet, uh, in terms of uh, ecologies of, of wood harvesting uh, and uh, also reforestation, uh, it looms as a very significant alternative uh, to the kinds of materials um, that we've been accustomed to to date. But wood, 
was additionally sidelined uh, on account of its flammability. Uh, and indeed, uh, in BC, until comparatively recently, um, the rule was that no wood structure could be more than four stories high uh, because of um, the risk of fire. Um, through um, various um, innovations in recent years, that uh, limitation has been eclipsed. And um, you know, the idea of six-story buildings um, was legitimated by this transformation uh, in the, um, the BC uh, law and also uh, was furthered uh, as a result of um, you know, various innovations in architecture by uh, one very sort of extraordinary example, which is Brock Commons, a student residence on the UBC campus, which is actually 18 stories high and is a, a timber construction. So we see then, you know, wood being used um, again, or a kind of renaissance of wood as a building material, both in terms of uh, the uh, structural qualities that it has, um, and I want to argue in terms of the sensory qualities um, that wood possesses. Um, that indeed wood, uh, and here, um, you know, I think that we need to uh, recognize, uh, you know, ways in which uh, wood, uh, you know, has multi-sensory properties. It's not just um, a visual uh, kind of, uh, of format, but rather um, there is the smell of wood, there is the way in which wood can alter the acoustics of a space, and there are, in this regard, ways in which we are to understand wood um, as um, a multi-sensory uh, building material, and it's that multi-sensoriality that can get us out of the hegemony of vision that Senate uh, and Palasma um, were lamenting when they speak of architecture having been reduced to a retinal art of the eye. So, uh, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, in a way, um, a development which is uh, both um, using natural resources, but it's using resources in a different way um, from the conventional uh, building constructions. And I want to sort of point to this as the possibility of these materials sylvanizing us. And by sylvanize, I mean, you know, sort of in that regard, um, instead of the ways in which we have humanized the forest through imposing our own uh, sorts of schemes on its management, uh, that this introduction of wood into, um, a reintroduction of wood into our everyday life world um, has the potential to uh, again, um, multiply the senses through which we interact with materials. You compare wood, for example, to steel uh, in terms of uh, the ways in which uh, wood you know, has a smell, has uh, properties of absorbing, but also uh, reflecting sound in, in significant ways. And in that regard, um, differs substantiality from um, the materiality um, of metal. This idea um, of you know, bringing um, the forest into the city and that treehouse uh, in Toronto, that design for a treehouse in Toronto um, is a, a beautiful example of that, that move, uh, goes along with another transformation that is, I think, highly significant uh, in terms of recent um, experiments um, in anthropology with uh, a new uh, kind of attitude towards sensing the forest. And here I'm referring to the work of Natasha Myers, for example, at uh, the University of, Tor uh, University of York, uh, York University in Toronto, um, who has been working on a methodology for a kind of sensory ethnography of the forest. Um, in order to understand the forest, um, you know, we can visualize it, we can use um, uh, you know, images from, um, you know, satellites uh, to map uh, it. Uh, but there is what uh, Myers is, is uh, you know, pointing towards is ways of attending uh, to the forest through the senses, through multiple senses um, that will in turn enable us to um, actually uh, put our fingers on the pulse, as it were, um, of the, the biome of the forest. 
And in that regard, you know, she is continuing in um, a tradition uh, that uh, was uh, inaugurated, you could say, by Henry David Thoreau, um, although Natasha Myers takes her uh, sort of cue from indigenous teachings and indigenous practices uh, in the way in which she has been exploring the oak savannas um, of uh, High Park um, in, in Toronto. Um, Thoreau, um, from his position in the New England wood, um, actually also in his own way um, made uh, uh, sort of an intimate contact with the forest and uh, a kind of sensory forestry, uh, the um, manner uh, in which he sort of felt we can arrive at the best understanding of these spaces. So um, Thoreau, you know, for example, um, practiced what one observer called an edible religion um, all the time when he went on his walks uh, in the, uh, the woods of Maine and, and in Concord uh, around Walden Pond. Um, he would be nibbling at things. So he would crush um, a leaf or uh, he would nibble uh, on, on the berries. And in that way, um, you know, actually um, sort of taste everything um, that was in nature. Uh, in this regard, it was an edible religion. This was a kind of communion that he established uh, with nature. Um, it was his way of appropriating uh, the forest, uh, his way of um, communing with the forest um, through you know, other senses than the visual, for example. Um, similarly, um, Thoreau, um, in addition to you know, sort of using his smell and his taste to um, sample all of the sensations that were on offer in the forest, he was a very tactile man. He writes, for example, my body is all sentient. As I go here or there, I am tickled by this or that I come in contact with. I can generally recall, have fresh in my mind, several scratches last received. So here you can see how actually he is constantly brushing against things um, and purposely letting himself be scratched and then savoring those scratches that he gets from his walks in the forest um, afterwards as mementos of um, this kind of sentience that he is seeking to cultivate through his body um, and arrive in that regard at uh, an embodied knowledge of the forest environment. At one point um, in his journals, he refers to the moss spotted skin of the earth in March as a great leopard lying out at length, a fur rug spread out to be inclined on. Okay, and so here um, you know, the moss um, invites him to recline on it as if he were um, actually reclining on a, a, a rug of, of leopard skin. Um, and he was always putting his skin in the game. Um, he was never, for example, just looking, but would use his eyes feelingly. This is an idea um, that uh, is difficult for us to grasp perhaps. But for example, he writes pines, pine trees, have, make a graceful fringe to the earth. And there, a fringe is a visual emblem, but it's also a tactile one. And we can understand, I think, immediately what he would mean uh, by this idea of the uh, pine as a graceful fringe to the earth. Or again, he says of an oak leaf, it is an island or a pond with rounded bays and pointed capes, and he becomes a mariner at sight of it. Um, so again, when you think about the form of an oak leaf, um, it is like, uh, in that regard, a, you know, a, a pond or rounded bays. Uh, they're so perfectly delineated. Uh, and this is what it means to see feelingly um, when he seeks to understand the world around him in this way. Um, but just contrast, you know, his his manner of um, deliberately brushing up against things so that he can enjoy those scratches um, with the way in which we urban dwellers, um, you know, um, enter into contact with our surroundings. Um, you know, you don't want to try lying down on a sidewalk because you'll be arrested for vagrancy. Um, and uh, in that regard, you know, keeping oneself to oneself um, is the watchword of our passage in public spaces. So um, there is a, a curtailed tactile um, existence there 
which, um, you know, arguably um, having a greater uh, presence of wood, um, which doesn't have the smoothness and the coldness of glass and steel, but rather has all these qualities of warmth, could help sylvanize us, could help bring our sense of touch back, um, and in this way constitute an antidote uh, to uh, the kind of, of problem that Senate and Palasma articulated at the beginning, uh, which is that uh, architecture um, is predominantly an art of the eye, uh, and uh, there is not sufficient attention in their estimation um, to all of the qualities of materials, and especially wood, um, that could bring such life, such vital life, back into um, our surroundings. So I'll end on, on that note uh, and then look forward to uh, any questions people might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for another compelling presentation. So we seem to have the, the chat and YouTube functioning, uh, seems to be going. We've launched the questions, so just a reminder to the public that there's a 30 to 60 second delay between uh, get, getting the question there and back to us. So perhaps while we're waiting for that, um, we did have a, a, a brief way of presenters to ask questions to each other uh, to get this, uh, this, this part of the uh, presentation rolling. And so um, I don't know who would like to begin if, if uh, either between Yehova and Jorge and Leila or, or Leila and David, who, who would like to, to start? I can, I can ask a Yehovah question, seeing as he hasn't, he's the one that last spoke, you know, hasn't spoken the longest. Yes. Um, so uh, this is a very, uh, a question that comes from my perspective, of course, when I see the images that you're working with. Um, I wanted to ask, outside the scientific research questions that you're using your 3D images uh, for, um, what have you come across when looking at this 3D images of the cell structures? Anything that has popped, that has caught your interest outside of your research questions? Yes, that's a, a good question. It's a good question that makes me feel, uh, make me think out of the box, right, of the science. And and of course, when, when I'm measuring or make, taking all those images, it's amazing to see, I think, uh, something uh, I, I very remember is be amazed it's being amazed by the image that I was uh, creating there and 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 actually that gave me some insight sometimes looking to those uh, 3d uh, images of the hydraulic uh, architecture of those species that reminded me a lot buildings right just like buildings and all those small uh, cells they are tricky it's like bricks and that's very curious i i mean that was not in, within my my research questions but i started to think what can we learn from nature right and uh i i think there is a lot to learn there and to be used in engineering for example or even architecture right yeah, that that was a feeling and and that was shared i have to say everybody it was uh working with me helping me doing the stuff they were so oh that's that's curious that's remind me a building being constructed like that's very interesting i hope i answer your question Yes, I can say on that on that point, you know, it's interesting this idea of biomimicry that you could find models for buildings in plant structures, uh, and this oh. is indeed another you know way in which architecture in recent years um, has been developing you know some very interesting uh, paths for development. So uh, the idea is that instead of uh, you know architecture 
being opposed to nature, um, architecture can become one with nature and use some of the same structures. And as I've been emphasizing the same qualities uh, in terms to enhance human quality of life. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I was, I was, I started to just think, uh, can we, we use some tools from engineering or, you know, like softwares, I, I say, to, to understand those structures there. Because I mean, that was a design, it was made over the evolutionary history of plants. So there's a something going on there. And they, there's a huge uh, biodiversity of those different setups. And I, I wonder, must be someone out there doing some research about that and under many different perspectives and that's very cool mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i was talk i was thinking about uh, exactly uh, architecture actually <laughs> and you're presenting is a uh, amazing study like bringing nature to the cities i really like that and and can i make a question about this for you uh Sure, sure, sure you hold yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, how, how do you, do you see uh, the possibility of implementing uh, this, this, uh, those projects using wood and bringing nature to, 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 to the cities? How long do you think? Well, I mean, there are, there are. It's going to take to, to. Right, right. Uh, you know, th there is this, uh, this ban I mentioned in New York, which is a very interesting development. Now, it's not actually opening the way for wood to be used. Um, I mean, I would, I think of that, that tree house that we saw, you know, from the image of, in, from Toronto um, is a, a, a wonderful way in which to go. But uh, the point is that, you know, BC has mandated um, that all, you know, state buildings, so that includes buildings on university campuses, have a wood infrastructure be, you know, constructed with beams, um, and frequently these uh, show on the, on the outside as well. And it's doing that, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm interested to hear Leila's concerns about that same, you know, uh, uh, extraction, uh, but it's doing that in order to uh, really emphasize this idea of uh, you know, wood being um, a material uh, that uh, is replenishable in a way that, uh, you know, sort of the endless asphalt that we've put down for our roads, the endless cement structures that we've put down, um, you know, is, is, is not. Um, wood uh, wears, wood ages in interesting ways. And, uh, you know, in that regard, one of the things about using um, you know, steel and glass is that it looks timeless, only it isn't. Uh, you know, it, uh, it, it too wears, but not in the same kind of way that, that wood wears. So, um, you know, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but, you know, there is uh, a significant uh, explosion of, you know, 10 uh, and 12 story buildings in London, England, uh, that are, you know, uh, using lumber typically from Sweden um, and uh, timber from Sweden. So there is this embrace of this material. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I'm interested uh, in this phenomenon uh, because again, it was seen as a, a vernacular material, you know, not something that a professional would want to engage with. Um, I don't have much experience building with wood, except for some bookshelves um, that I still um, I'm very very proud of, um, and yet uh, you know those that experience of that kind of of construction was was um, you know was really Im important to me, and I also actually did a chair, but it was not something that you could sit in, and so you know I don't suggest that any everybody should take up a hammer and saw and and start you know making the world over in wood. Uh, in instead of you know, plastic and, and so forth, the substances that many of our um, you know, life surfaces are, are made of. Uh, but I do you know, want to emphasize uh, the way in which, you know, compared to the unyielding surface of metal or glass, you know, wood 
um, sort of engages us and what is the significance of that engagement. Um, so I was talking both about wood as building material, but also you know, the forest as a space for us to come uh, to know, uh, you know, through, um, you know, not the sort of scientific lens of the, um, you know, forest scientist, but through this intimate sensorial lens that Natasha Myers and indeed Henry David Thoreau um, might be seen to represent. But if I could ask Leila, I mean, it seems to me that with, you know, your, your elastic spaces, what you're doing is creating um, depth and depth sort of suggests tactility. And I would love to hear you on some of the ways in which, you know, this IMAX, uh, you know, technology, uh, by virtue of the way that it brings three dimensions in, is creating a space for the haptic. Uh, one of the things about the illusions that you create is precisely that haptic intimacy with spaces. And I'd love to hear you on, on you know, what, what differs about this form of visualization, this medium um, that you have um, you know, developed so, so brilliantly? Okay, so I'm happy to talk about that. And I, I'm going to invite Jorge to join me as well. Uh, one of the things that we discovered when we unpacked the media from the shoot in 2016 was just how difficult it was to show. I think Jorge began to, to give you a sense of that. But once we actually got it projected, it was a magical space that um, Sarah, who is a geographer and a primatologist actually, um, she as a teenager had uh, chained herself to logging trucks to prevent the logging of that exact same space where you see the bridge. The bridge was the site uh, and the bridge was built by Macmillan Blodell, who have since gone, um, who, who have since disappeared. But what we found was that um, combining that with audio, so I talked a little bit about the audio which is felt in your body as opposed to audio which is heard in your ears. When we worked with that felt sense of audio and the stretch of space, um, we realized we're a lot more interested in VR, which is embodied. And we were talking about the walking viewer. And we realized that what we created was a walking viewer space, not a seated viewer. We tried to um, put the seats in the black box and uh, look at it. And it, it changed it immensely. If one was mobile and moving. So that tactility of walking combined with the video and then the audio. I don't know if you recall the image of um, the tree that's very high with a person about halfway up. We were recording audio spatially as well. And it was an experiment that came close to working and that we'd like to return to work on. And what we did was to um, send audio cable up the tree and across the what's known as uh, emerald pool and then move the microphone along that space and so we got some really interesting results uh, mm -hmm. in terms of that addition of audio as well as video and i i just like to have jorge jump in too in terms of this kind of experimentation, both with the blur that we did, mm -hmm. and it's um, the sense of how the audio is felt as opposed to just heard. Yes, I think uh, one of the experimentations we did that with the blur, um, this is for a forest breath that the audience would go from one 3D clip to the next, which it can hurt the eyes and that was our challenge. So we didn't know what we could do to go from one to the other. And then that blur, we, what we did is we combined a 3D space that um, it's really a trick, it doesn't exist per se, but 
we took the 3D space from one clip and the one that went afterwards, and we created a blur that you kind of went in and out. And then when you're in that, we felt you, you feel something. And then as uh, Leela mentioned with the subwoofer, it, you start vibrating to a, as much as we were allowed to do it in a gallery. Uh, but it, it, it really had a feeling of, of, of space. And then when you go from that blur into a new space, the, the 3D effect, the depth of field came with uh, an actual feeling um, on the body. And especially with uh, the black box that is 50 foot by 50 foot cube, it has allowed us to see uh, each viewer handle why, like how they walk around the space differently. Some like to get really up close to the screen and others like to walk all the way back. So we realized that this idea that the viewer just wants to sit and watch wasn't true for everybody. Some wanted to move around, some would stay very still, others would move around. So there was a lot of experimentation that we have been able to do, especially because of the space that we have here at Concordia. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, you know, fascinating examples of the, the multi-sensoriality of, you know, sort of bringing in that other dimension and then really accentuating the spatiality of sound uh, and the ways in which, you know, that can uh, create an atmosphere where there is presence. I mean, one of the things that we experience in the forest is precisely that presence. Um, and in, in that regard, um, you know, uh, as an important uh, opening to other ways of, of living. Um, I think that there's um, uh, a, um, a, a question um, and uh, would-, would um, It's from coming from I'm... Yehovah. Uh, okay. before, just before going there, I was just thinking about the, um, this question of architecture that, you, that everyone has addressed in a, in a special way tonight as the, an architecture not of stability, but of, I wouldn't necessarily say fragility, but of sensitivity or sensibility um, that will break out uh, of, our, of our patterns of just considering wood as resource. Um, I think that, the, that all of the presentations tonight make us, enable us to think of and to feel um, that the, the action and presence of wood in our lives is, is, is so integral to moving forward in this period of crisis um, of, of this. Uh, and then I'm going to segue into your question, Yehovah, that this crisis we're living is, is not recognizing the fragility that is that that we do live with. And we're always trying to impose these structures that will somehow last, but that we know that they won't. And so the presence of wood, like you were saying, David, is that the, the, the wood will get worn. It's like every day when you walk on a step, well, there's going to be gradually a groove that gets that gets um, uh, that will change the presence how that step will function in time and eventually that groove might not even be a step anymore you know so I mean we're interested in the material world as something that does change and so in this in this question of fragility and sensibility accepting that fragility and working with it I think is something that will um, can it, and uh, perhaps uh, enable a, another way of being in the world with with all of, with all of these worlds, uh, this mm -hmm. worldling with wood. And so maybe Yehovah, do you want me to ask the question or do you, you, you go ahead, you, you can say it. Yes, because um, I see, I see uh, the lack of care for nature and all this climate crisis we're living in are at least in part is given to this rupture, right? human nature integration. So there's a, this long-standing claim, uh, technology is the cause of this rupture. So uh, maybe there's a question for everybody, if you guys think, if you agree with that claim, and if technology could draw us close to nature and help us to restore this uh, integration it was lost, right? Good question. <laughs> uh, I, I, 
I agree. <laughs> I think it's a it's a good it's a very clear claim. Um, and this might not answer the question right away, but the, the a key something that has happened a few times because weirdly uh, with forest project when we're showing it to people we are showing them nature and for a lot of uh, the viewers it's something that is so far away from their day-to-day -day life or they have never seen anything like that i mean we have for a, in a small way recreated you know an old growth forest in vancouver in the basement of in a downtown montreal building that is in a box that it's made out of cement underground yet you're you now think you're in this forest and you really do feel something which as having been to that forest it, it is as the feeling of size how small one is um but at the other end and and especially in the part about could this help restore that equilibrium um i have seen it interestingly when we have gone to port renfrew and gone to uh, Pachita First Nation, uh, and we showed members of the community the aerial or, or, or the 3D material, and they'll turn to us and go, where is that? And that is 20 minutes or 30 minutes away from where they live. Mm -hmm. But it's, that is something that can happen. People might not be connected to it for whatever reason. They might go to the city or not ever go look at the trees in that way so it did we have seen it happen as an example of we show it to people show the technology and they're now interested in going to see and appreciating the real thing so that would i have seen yeah you know that, that's something interesting here i just remember when teaching uh, that happened to me as well when teaching and talking about leaves and we had a tree just outside the window and i was you know, drawing the, the leaf on the blackboard, you know, <laughs> we sometimes we disconnect with nature sometimes, and we need to, to use this in our favor. And I think we guys show this brilliantly in many different ways. Yeah. I, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the old growth uh, trees that we uh, were documenting. Uh, one of the forestry scientists we're working with, Suzanne Simard, uh, has talked about this old growth trees and her work over the last 30 years has been on the underground communication of trees. And she renamed the old growth tree, the oldest tree in the, in the, the grove, a mother tree, because she wanted to look at um, forestry practices and the problems of tree farm uh, planting, which is a mono culture and often then results in uh, diseases. And uh, she's documented that quite well. And she's also talked about um, once you lose that old growth tree that is anywhere from you know, 2000, 3000 years old, it's, it's carbon, um, data that's held in its cells, um, when it's clear cut, it doesn't have time to transfer that to the other trees in the grove. So she's talked about how that knowledge is lost. And not only that, the carbon is released into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems, one of the elders working with us, Bill Jones, has been on a blockade for the last few months and it's in a place called Ferry Creek and the the lumber company that the Petit had thought had stopped uh, logging have restarted logging and the um, some of the people writing have said there's a financial incentive to the lumber companies cutting down old growth forests because they're worth three times as much but once they're gone they're gone and the, the role that they play within the forest is so significant, not just for that tree, but for the whole grove and how they're able to fight disease. And uh, one of the um, kinds of practices that Nancy Turner uh, has brought forward in terms of the West Coast, as well as um, 
many nations, for instance, it's Sami in Sweden, it's called culturally modifying trees. So using a part of the tree as needed. Um, these practices go back 10,000, 15,000 years. There's been carbon dating to prove it. And then the tree continues to live. So my question to David was, are there sustainable practices that the designers can put in place to, for instance, protect the, these old growth, old growth forests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of a supply chain and how, yes. what kind of wood is used? Yeah. And I'm, you know, my argument is, was about how to save humanity. And your argument is about how to save the forest. And uh, indeed, you know, the larger picture was uh, Jehovah, uh, who was talking about you know all the ways in which these uh, trees are maintaining that that equilibrium? So how do you square the two? You know, I mean, uh, you know, in many ways, glass and steel are efficient, okay, and economical, um, and uh, you know, um, in that regard, are um, less weighted with the kinds of considerations that you're bringing up, and. You know, when, when British Columbia, um, you know, sort of uh, has this wood first policy, uh, you know, uh, well, what are, the, what are the constraints within that? Uh, I'm saying that, you know, I think that that idea of wood first, uh, you know, is a, a, a sylvanizing element, okay? Not a humanizing element, but a sylvanizing one. And that could be beneficial. Uh, but, uh, you know, if it results in cutting old growth, then no, this is this is just not on. You had a point. Well, it's it's just that to talk about forestry practices, how to do the the second growth, third growth, you know, and for designers to begin to choose what trees they use. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, meetings I attended in 2017 was um, the union uh, representing the people who cut down the trees. And they, um, one of the unions on the island said, we, we won't cut down your trees anymore for you. We will not cut the old growth trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, the image that you see with the camera, with Chris and I, in the background is one of the trees that was saved in a clear cut, which is called Lonely Doug. Um, but, you know, the clear cuts, nothing grows for a very long time. And to think about forestry practices in a different way. I'm not, I think the wood is exciting as a building material. It's more, how do we influence the supply chain and talk about what, which wood, you know, is going to be allowed. And that, that's why I brought up the culturally modified trees as an example, to think about the trees in the forest as part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And how do we, how do we do this sustainably? Mm -hmm. If I can say, I think designers and architects are a lot more concerned about sourcing now. Uh, you know, they they recognize uh, you know the uh, uh, the imprint, and so you know, ethically sourced is become a real concern, um, and that has to be a part of the aesthetic. So you know, it's not just aesthetic; it's also ethic. So an as ethic. Um, is you know precisely what we need to develop here, uh, and I think that architects and designers are becoming attuned to that. Uh, but um, definitely, you know what you point in term to in terms of uh, you know which growth. Uh, these are are key kinds of elements. If I can say one other thing, um, you know we talk a lot about smart cities and smart environments and living in an information age, uh, but to me. Uh, you know, that uh, is actually part of the problem. Uh, what we need is responsive cities and we need to responsibilize ourselves. And this is where uh, I'm suggesting heightened sensory interaction makes us more sensitive, makes us more sensible, sensibilizes us to uh, these you know, sort of disequilibriums, uh, such as, as you've been describing, Leila. Uh, and, you know, in that regard, uh, is is the way forward. Now that's not anti-technological necessarily to go back to Jehovah's question, um, but imagine that, you know, a responsive city instead of a smart city, uh, a responsive city would have 
uh, these kinds of materials being used and these kinds of equilibriums potentially established. That's, that's such a great way to end or begin yet another conversation later. I think that uh, this question of SMART, uh, there's a whole uh, set of uh, research programs now that are called SMART forests. And uh, the, the action of sensing what's going on within the tree and the ecosystem of the forest is also enabling to get closer to what is the reality of the tree uh, and, and, and the forest at, at large as well. So we're working on these different scales. And I think that gets back to a question of architecture. Um, what is being st structured as a result of these different worlds colliding or coalescing. I think they're already doing that, but what, what will we put forth as the methods for connecting? I think that's probably one of our biggest questions uh, right now, our realities. And um, so it's, it's 8.30 and um, thank you so much, everyone. It's, uh, I would really, I'd love to pursue this in other ways after. Thank you for being there, for sharing your research. And um, I don't know if Nina wants to say something just before we take off, but the, there will be a, the recording on YouTube to share. And uh, I do really, would really appreciate to, con to pursue this um, in, in other ways, as I think there's a lot to be said around these, this, this convergence of science, um, anthropological, anthropological sensory, and um, old growth being in the forest, presenting forests in different locations. I think we're working through the notion of the, the movement between these worlds, which will enhance the experience. Um, so Nina, I don't know if you're, if you're, and. <laughs> you're there. And, yes, uh, I am here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. So we're we're just going to uh, so so good night and good night to everyone. There were no questions from the public, but I think we had a few issues with the chat, and um, and let's let's continue this. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>